how did you learn this? I mean, were you just born an entrepreneurial spirit or is there somebody in your life that was a positive influence in this regard? I think the entrepreneurial skills I got is from my grandmother. She'd always bring me to the wet market at around four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning. And I've learned by watching all of the people in the wet market. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show. I'm your host, Nora Dunn, and I'm also known as the Professional Hobo. And in this series, I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles and remote careers to get the real dirt on what it's like to travel long-term and work abroad. And my guest today has plenty of experience, and I'm really excited to chat with her. She is Catch Medina Howe. Catch is from Laguna, Philippines. In 2013, after working in Kuwait and Iraq for a few years, she quit her nine to five job and headed off backpacking Southeast Asia. In late 2014, having embraced a nomadic lifestyle, she began travel blogging on a full-time basis. Then after four years of adventure traveling, followed by two years sailing the Caribbean, she moved and bought a stone house villa in Montenegro in 2019 to start a new expat life with her cats. Aside from writing about her adventures, Katch has been blogging about traveling around the world based on her experience of visiting 146 countries. She aims to travel to every country in the world using only her Philippines passport. Welcome to the show, Katch. I'm so excited to catch up with you here. I know. Thank you, Nora. I really appreciate it. And as far as I know, we've known each other for so long. Like you interviewed us um, in one of your articles, like I think in 2015 or 16. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think I, I had you on my Week in the Life series and then I had you on my financial yeah. case study series. I mean, yes. we've been traveling in similar circles for many, many years now. So I love this series because it gives me a chance to actually get a chance to really yeah. dig into some some really interesting things about travel. And I listen. I got a list of questions here for you, but <laughs> okay. I want to, I want to start at the beginning because I found this very interesting. The first time that you left the Philippines was shortly after mm -hmm. college when you went to work in Kuwait and Iraq. What yes. were you doing there? And then what was the tipping point for you to quit your nine to five and start traveling the world? Mm -hmm. So technically I actually left the Philippines for the first time when I was 20, like just one month after I graduated from my university, I had a bachelor's degree in economics and my father was working in Kuwait and I actually asked him if I could get an on the job training at the Philippine embassy because I wanted to experience how it is and just work there like, you know, like just volunteer for three months, come back to the Philippines to, to study law as I wanted to become a diplomat and it will take like maybe another like, you know, five, five years for me to finish. But when I arrived in Kuwait, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't like politics. I don't like how how this works. Like, I, I really don't understand. And I was like interviewing people, like, how much do you make from this? And I thought like, if you are working at the embassy, you automatically have like diplomatic passport and stuff like that. I was like, oh, it doesn't work that way. So I ended up working for a private healthcare company. I started like doing, like I, I was like 20, I was doing like um, all like uh, administrative job until like I became like the executive assistant of the, you know, like the operations, the, like the COO and I was doing quality assurance and I was like, wow, this is so cool for a 21 year old. I was like making good money compared to my friends in the Philippines. But after I, I was there 2009 to 2012 and 2012. I moved to Iraq because I've heard that if with my skill working in quality assurance and HSC, health, safety and environment, I could easily land a job for an oil company. So I flew from Kuwait to Kurdistan, Iraq that time uh, to work. Uh, I ended up working for one American company based in Erbil. And uh, yeah, but I only stayed there for like four five months. And I quit my job because they asked me to sign a contract where I will not get any vacation. And that time I was broken hearted as well. I was like, mm, I was making decent money, but I was like, mm, this is not fun. Like really like, so I left and I, my, my plan was just to do like a six months, uh, you know, like w travel around Asia, India and South America, and then go back either to Kuwait or Iraq or to Dubai, because with the skills that I have and my work background, I could easily get back and land a job. That's what I thought. But then I didn't come back. 
<laughs> I haven't been back to the <laughs> Middle East since then. <laughs> You know, you're similar to me in that when I when I left, I didn't know how long I would be going for. Uh, yeah. Although I, I, I definitely allowed for the possibility that I might come back, but then I might also not. So, what happened to you on the road that made you realize you didn't want to go back? Um, so I started. I actually left Iraq and then flew back to the Philippines and stayed there for two weeks because, uh, you know, working in Iraq, I didn't have a bank account. So I brought like I sent money through Western Union to my family and like you know I brought cash and I went back to the Philippines and I reopened my old um, bank account so just to make sure whatever happens is that. And then during that time, I had a condominium that I was paying for years since I started working in Kuwait and I had to make sure that like I was I'll be able to pay it off for the first. Six months so when I go travel without job I'll be sorted you know and I left the Philippines I told all of my friends like this is what I plan to do and by this time I already traveled to 14 countries when I was still working in the Middle East you know and I was like okay this is easy I just plan to travel to like 10 countries and just explore three continents like two continents uh, Europe and America is not is outside of my radar because you need the visa and for, for a Filipino like me who's unemployed it's not possible so i left the philippines and flew to thailand and i brought my brother and sister with me who that time was only 22 and 20 years old i was like okay come come with me i'm gonna pay for you for like one month of travel and but we are backpacking we're backpackers and then we stayed in backpackers hostels we did couch surfing and you know like i was like wow this is amazing i can only spend 20 dollars for the three of us and we'll survive and you know you meet other fellow travelers and unexpectedly i met uh, my ex-husband who i ended up traveling with for the last eight years and it changed the course of my plans you know like when you get in love like you you wanted to like just stick to it and like figure out what's going to happen next and when I first met you two online, yeah. you were doing all kinds of really interesting things to to make money. Because yeah. I, I guess eventually you realized the money was going to run out. You had to make some money along the way. And you yes. were doing, you were teaching English, you were teaching yeah. yoga, you were doing massage. I mean, you had all kinds yeah. of interesting jobs along the way. In addition to blogging, how mm -hmm. did you find these gigs as you were traveling? Ever since I was a kid, and even I had like, I was working, I, I was studying or working, I always have side hustle. Like I don't make, I don't want to have like my, my source of income from one thing. I make sure I have like three or four different sources. Like if this fucked up, I wanted the other, other like stream of income coming to me. Because if you grew up from poverty, you don't want to go back there. And I will never go back there. When I arrived in Asia, like my ex-husband, he's British. And when he quit his job, he was 28 that time. He knew that he's going to Asia to teach English because like if you're British you could make like 20 25 dollars an hour teaching English in, in China or Vietnam and we ended up living in Vietnam and while we were there like we worked there for seven months and we're like wow this is so cool we could like you know I retrained myself to become a TEFL teacher and he's already doing that and he's working for one school and then did another editing so he has like two three jobs and I ended up doing two, three jobs while we were in Vietnam. Even though um, we worked so hard, we were only able to save like $10,000, which we used to fund our trip to India to become um, um, a Tantra Yoga certified teachers. We did like 200 hours, like one, one month of training. And then we're like, okay, but teaching yoga is not that much. Teaching English is only applicable in like countries that is not English speaker. It's like, why not we do Ayurveda massage therapy? Ayurveda was like that time, if you're from West, Western, uh, you know, in other countries, it'll be like, wow, people pay much more than this. It's not just like typical massage. I'm like, okay, we trained that too. And then we went to the UK and then flew to South America. But by the time we arrived in South America, we were so broke. We decided just to go, you know, volunteering. And at the same time, we work with different hotels and tell them, like, if you bring us a client to do yoga and massage, we give you commissions. And that's, you know, like, I, you know, I made, I closed a deal with them. So they bring us like clients. We stayed in Ollantay Tambo in Cusco, Peru. So these are like the people who just finished hiking Machu Picchu. Of course they wanted a massage. And if like someone foreigner, it looks like, oh, I'm much more pro than anyone local. And uh, that's when we started the travel blogging thing. Like, you, okay, 
like a lot of people were asking like by that time we were traveling for so long like how do you finance it and that's how we started the blog thing i definitely am going to dig in a little bit later into how your online career has evolved because that's an interesting story unto itself but you've already given me a couple of clues that you were very entrepreneurial i, I mean you talked about that you had a condo that you were paying off uh, that you obviously bought fairly early in life and in your career and also you've talked about the fact that you always had a side hustle your strategy to give hotels commissions uh, in exchange for clients. I mean, that's brilliant. So how did you, how did you learn this? I mean, were you just born an entrepreneurial spirit or is there somebody in your life that was a positive influence in this regard? I think the entrepreneurial skills I got is from my grandmother, uh, because, um, I grew up in a broken family. And when I was four, I was sent by my parents to live with my grandmother in the province because I ended up having two younger siblings and it's not easy for my parents to take care of three kids and while they're working. And it's a typical tradition in the Philippines that the kids will be taken care of the grandparents by the grandparents. So when I moved to San Pablo city, uh, Laguna, a few years later, my parents separated. And of course, uh, my, my, my mother's side with my grandparents are not, uh, they're in actually above a little poverty line. Like what you earn today is just for food. And if you don't earn anything tomorrow, you, you lose money. And I remember my grandmother like has a grocery store, even until now she has that a little, little grocery store. You just take a stall thing because, uh, I was the one who, who's living with them. She'd always bring me to the wet market at around four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning. And can you believe since I was uh, like five years old until last, like last year, I always wake up at five o'clock, always. Wow. I, like it would change because of the time zone or what, but my body automatically wakes up at five o'clock. Like my entire freaking life is just like that. And I learned these things from my grandparents that, you know, like then the haggling, the negotiating, not technically from her, but I've learned from her mistakes. And I've learned by watching all of the people in the wet market, how they do things, how they deceive people, how you cannot be screwed and those kind of things. And since elementary and high school, because, you know, like you only get money money from like a fixed allowance that they'll give you like they'll give you a dollar a day just to buy your food but I don't want that I don't like something simple I knew when I was young that I want something big and I always wanted to do that and I know that my parents or no one in my family can help me and that's how it worked like even when I was young I'll always have side hustle so I have extra money that I could afford to buy something that I like just like a fear of not being like not being able to have freedom to do whatever you want and the fear that you'll end up being like the parents or your grandparents. And because I know that I have the blueprint of how they handle their finances. And I knew I was conscious that I will never have the blueprint that they have. Talking about the wet market being your, your school for haggling yeah. and, and tips and skills that ultimately would help you in your travels, which... Mm -hmm. Let's get it right. You've been to 146 countries. I actually, and you... 150 now. <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, you've been... wow. So you've been to 150 countries. You've done it all yeah. on a Philippines passport, which my yes. understanding is that is not very easy. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're on a mission to visit every country in the world with your Philippines yes. passport. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to travel with a Philippines passport? And do you have any advice and tips for someone who might be traveling with a similar passport? It's hard, but it's doable. It's very expensive too. And like sometimes when I go to a new country, my ex-husband was British. So we'd go to a country and he'd walk in and like, no problem. He doesn't have to pay, no interrogation. And then they interrogate me and they have to pay. I was like, I already have the weak passport and I still have to pay. Like you have the strong passport and you're free. Like, you know, like that kind of, the rich doesn't, you know, if you're rich, you don't, and you, you stay in nice places for free because like your connections and stuff, it, it's like that in, in real life. But uh, what I've noticed uh, for someone like me with this passport, it's really hard at the beginning, but once you get the, the main visas from countries like Canada, USA, UK, Schengen, or Australia, it's a game changer. Because when I had my USA visa on my Philippines passport in Colombia in 2015, it changed my whole life because since then, I was able to travel the entire Caribbean or Central America and even get an e-visa to Turkey because I have a valid U.S. visa on my passport. 
And with my US visa, I was able to travel to the States where I am right now. And here I can easily apply for visas in countries that is so difficult to apply in the Philippines. Like, because when you're already in the States, Americans doesn't need to apply for visa. So when you apply, these people will just give it to you because no one is applying there. And for you to enter the States, they know that you're not planning to do illegal in the countries where you're going to visit because you're already in America. This is the place where you could do illegal thing. You know, like that's what they're, they're thinking. Like they, they don't want the Philippines to go here because they might think that, you know, you're going to work here illegally and stuff like that. One of the best things that happened to me is like becoming a travel blogger because whenever they do interview or like they hold me at the immigration, I'll tell them like, um, you can just Google me and then you will see, you know, like not, not being arrogant, but it helped me like actually last a few days ago, I was held at the immigration here in the United States at the Homeland Security because I was in and out of the states. I was I went I went out to Paraguay and then come back. I went to the Caribbean and come back. And then the last stop was Trinidad and Tobago. And then I came back after a few days, and they were like, oh, "What are you doing in the United States?" And I was like, I had to explain what I do for a living. And I told them like, "Um, this is my name on Google, and then you could just search, and they'll find you know articles in Forbes or you know the BBC thing and." Time magazine, like time.com and, and stuff like that. And it helped me. Like I, I, I'm actually grateful for my job that it really helped me. But before making a name out of myself with a with a travel blogging world, um, I think what helped is like by just getting all of those visas uh slowly uh, but surely. I think that that is excellent advice to add and also to to apply for uh, onward visas in a country that is already uh, that was like like in the states as an example. Mm-hmm. I think that that is that is brilliant advice. Uh, and it's so funny because in immigration, when I go through immigration, I'm actually really quiet about the website. I actually, for all these yeah. years, have not wanted people to know that I'm working online because I think they're afraid. I'm afraid that they're gonna not let me in because I'm working online. Because really, <laughs> until the pandemic, this was not a common thing. People did not understand this lifestyle. So I think they were afraid that I was going to, you know, the professional hobo, she's ho- she's going to come here and fall off the grid and I don't know, eat our sandwiches. So, so, uh, so it's really fascinating that you've actually, that's actually something that has helped you along the way. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I'm going to tell anyone to Google me anytime soon, but there yeah. you go. I, I know it's possible. No, I, didn't. <laughs> I just did it when they hold me. Like, usually I don't, but I was like, <laughs> um, like just, just to verify, you can Google me. Like, you know, like I think it would like I, the internet. Yeah. Well, you know, they will see different details about it's like, okay, I'm not here to work illegally. I have other jobs, some kind of, yeah. Absolutely. Do you know who I am? <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I like no. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> you, know you need to be very humble, like oh, like innocent and humble. I cannot say, "Hey, you." But like I, I tell that politely. And actually, yeah. that the funny thing is, like, um, I ended up having more followers from immigration officers. And sometimes they actually <laughs> message me, they're like, "Like my photos, go, 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 go." And I'm like, "Okay, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I never actually thought of that as a way to get followers. Brilliant. Yeah. See, there you go. There's that entrepreneur spirit showing its face it's again because like uh, <laughs> they helped me in Colombia too I was traveling with friends and they asked questions like how much money do you have how come you have a lot of cash in your bag and blah 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 it's like we're applying to travel for six months blah blah, blah. and they, they they asked so many questions and I asked I told them like uh, like you know I, I'm actually um, you know I, I'm a blogger you can find me on Instagram it's like and then they check I'm not very big on Instagram but like after they check everything and they even took photos with me I was like well if you became more <laughs> famous they will talk me I'm like yeah sure <laughs> so it's, it's actually a good way to 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 increase your following <laughs> Wow. Brilliant. So, all right. You inspired a question when you mentioned that you had a lot of cash in your bag. I, in my research, read that you only recently got your first credit card and that for all of these years of traveling full time, you've actually done it with cash and debit cards and PayPal. Why is that? Actually, the funny thing is I don't have credit card anymore. We just recently, we got it uh, two years ago with my ex-husband, like two, three years ago with his name in the United Kingdom. And we didn't, and then now I don't have it because we separated. So he has it, I don't have it. <laughs> so um, uh, throughout the year since 2013, actually since 2011 and until now, I never had credit card. Like everything that I do for my entire freaking life is cash. Like anything that I earn, I'll only purchase something that I can afford with the money that I already have. So, and this is something that I've been like 
proud about my entire life. I had the credit card when I was in Kuwait, uh, but I only had it for one year and never had anything or never borrowed and money just to finance like i i follow the system of full you know like the envelope system when i was um uh way younger and only start last year because i was like yeah just spend all the money but like um but for years i have this system that i wanted to buy a laptop i'm gonna put money in the laptop like I, i'll make sure i'll save it up for it and then just just buy for it because with the nomadic lifestyle and everything i cannot do installment the only thing that i did with installment was the condominium that i had in the philippines which eventually, you know, got the, like uh, refunded that they returned me the they returned the money, which supported the entire travel lifestyle in the last few years. So yeah, I don't have credit card again. <laughs> I only have a transferwise and Revolut card, and you know, like my typical bank accounts in the Philippines and PayPal. I'm with you 100% about not being in debt, not wanting to use debt. The difference between you and I is I charge almost everything I possibly can to a credit card. Uh, I pay it off at the end of every month without fail. So I'm not going into debt, but I'm doing it uh, partly because it's e I find it easier to charge things to credit cards. And in many cases, you need a credit card to you know make a reservation uh, you know for a hotel or whatever. Um, but then also, of course, I'm in it for the frequent flyer miles. Um, I know. But then, yeah. but then yeah. also, here's, here's the, the big thing for me, and I don't know if you've had any challenges with this along the way. If, for whatever reason, my credit card number is compromised, uh, it, it, is, it, it is immediately flagged. And then like I'm not responsible for any fraudulent purposes, uh, purchases. Whereas if my debit card got compromised, the the person who who stole that or who stole that information could actually drain my bank account have you had any near misses like that along the way oh thankfully i don't have and actually now i have i'm not i'm not sponsored by transferwise or wise account you know uh, they wise. have like um uh, they have like different way you could have like a digital card so if i have to purchase everything online i'll use like the, the, their prepaid card that is you know like disposable thing like one-time purchase or, or stuff like that oh. and then i didn't uh, even know they had that yeah and then the cool thing about it as well uh, whenever i use it because now you could use it with apple pay as well so whenever you use it it's automatically notify my phone like i used it or someone tried to use it or like whatsoever and then i could just easily block it um, thankfully, I hope knock on wood that I'll never experience those those things. But I made sure that uh, even though I have like one transfer wise, I have three different cards. I have a Revolut. I have two different cards. You know, like I have my Philippines bank, and I have few different cards. So just made sure that everything is you know being tracked by my phone. Absolutely brilliant. I also believe in, in diversifying cards because if something bad happens to one, you've got others. And then, of course, also you use cash. Do you have any cash. tips regarding carrying cash and regarding exchanging cash? Do you have mm -hmm. any tips for us? Well, usually you can only carry maximum ten thousand uh, dollars wherever you go, and then they'd also question you why you have that, you know, like unless you'll be traveling like long term and and, and things. But cash is always king, you know. Um, but in the last few months, like for example, I'm go I went to Trinidad and Tobago, and I only carried four hundred dollars because, as far as I know, the country usually use card, like you know, like I can Apple Pay or like swipe or or, or anything, or I prepaid all of the accommodation and prepaid all of like. Yeah, you know, like just use the cash for like random tours. But um, what you do with the car uh, with the cash is like you make sure it's separated, like one in your wallet, one in one of your small backpack, one in your big bag, and you just you you just separate it and and hide it in some places that you will you know like people will not find. I think that's that's the easiest. And of course, um, now that I am thirty three, I no longer stay in a backpackers hostel. I prefer if I stay, I make sure I have my own room with my own keys and bathroom. And it will like, give you more peace of mind compared to before where you, you stay in a backpacker's dorm and share it with a lot of people. And usually what they do now, because transfer-wise, even though they charge a bit with the withdrawal, it's still a really decent exchange rate. So whatever I do is I, I just convert how much I think I'm going to be spending for the week and I just withdraw it. It's, it's, it's easier for me. All right. So you withdraw in the country whatever currency you'll be needing. Yes. Because now that we discard, they are not like as crazy as your normal bank where they charge the fees and they charge this exchange rate and the exchange rate is horrible. With WISE, if I withdraw, maybe I'll be charged extra 3 to $5 and that's it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. 
You should and what sponsor ha- me. You- I should contact them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote an article a year ago because I started using TransferWise, which is now called yeah. Wise, uh, I don't know, about a year and a half or two years ago. And then I did yeah. some math and realized that I saved over $2,000 a year in fees, mostly PayPal yeah. fees. Uh, that I avoid because Wise has these amazing currency conversion rates. And yeah, it, it's you see all the fees. They're very uh, transparent about them. And it's a great way to convert currency, to get paid and to pay other people. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's amazing. And the good thing about Wise too is like there's different currency. So I have like Euro if I'm in Europe, dollars when I'm in, in USA. And it, it just really helps. All right, I want to change gears because I'm really excited to talk to you about Montenegro. I have not been to Montenegro, but the pictures of your stone villa are amazing. And I know that you've also pivoted your business now. You help people get their visas and their residency in Montenegro. So can Mm -hmm. you please talk to me a little bit about why you think Montenegro is a great place to live? And do you have any advice for someone who might want to get their residency there? Sure. Like I actually first visited Montenegro in 2017, came back again uh, on winter for sailing trip because I was invited by the tourism organization. And in 2018, I went back there as invited again, but with my sister during summer, I was like, this is freaking cool. Like the weather and everything is like, this is freaking amazing. And the people are such good, like good looking, like women and men. I was like, oh, it's just like really like nice to look at. And, um, and then in 2019, uh, after we sold our sailboat in Puerto Rico, we were like planning to move back to Europe. And our plan was to, um, to move and live in Portugal. But that time there's this Brexit thing. You don't know what's going to happen. And, and we we're like, okay, Montenegro might be the easiest because we could uh, we actually ended up paying 550 euro for a two bedroom penthouse apartment overlooking the entire sea and it's fully furnished and they accepted our two cats. I was like, wow, 550 euro and this thing would cost us maybe how much? 2,500 pounds or like $3,000, you know, that kind of thing. And actually some friends said like, that's actually still expensive. It's like, well, it was fine for us. <laughs> and um, when we moved there, we just figured out that the cost of living is really cheap. And when we chose to live in Herzegnovi, and at that time, it's so easy for us to travel via Dubrovnik, which is a popular destination in Croatia, and also from Ivat Airport, which is in Montenegro, and you could fly EasyJet, Ryanair to go to the main cities or, you know, fly to Serbia, and or Podgorica, which is the capital where we, I could fly with Turkish Airlines easily, and at that time, Turkish Airlines was our sponsor. I was like, okay, this is so strategic. And like the cost of living, we could live here for like 1,500 euro a month for two of us with the two cats and like just live like nicely. And then eventually, like I got an, I got involved in a car accident in Pakistan. That's And our house was in a penthouse and I couldn't walk because there's no elevator. That's when we started to look for to buy a house. And when we bought the house, you know, like got the residency, you can get a residency in three ways from the property, from uh, from starting your own DOO as a self-employed and by, by employment. And we found out like, wow, this is so easy. We met an accountant, a lawyer and everything. And we're like, wow, we should do this. We should get into this kind of thing. And the pandemic hit. Uh, because prior to living in Montenegro, I was already doing um, visa and immigration consulting for Filipinos. As I said, it's so hard for Filipino passport to get it, but it became my bread and butter because it's so hard to do it, but I've done it. So I'm helping people to do it. And they trust me that I could help them because I've already experienced it. So it's something like that. And But when we realized that there's a big opportunity of bringing Asians or any other nationalities to Montenegro, because not everyone knows that you could immigrate there and buy a property or set up your small business where like we decided like okay get that started with this and when when the pandemic hits digital nomad became like a talk of like google everywhere and we're like wow we should just get started so i started the montenegro digital nomads and remote workers and it's now an ngo there and there's actually an increasing number of digital nomads moving to Montenegro because of the cost of living. Getting a like a one year visa is easier than what you think than compared to the other countries. And the lifestyle of adventure, if you like mountains, go hike. Like after you go down, you can go swim. And it's free to swim. And you know, like you can just rent a car for like 250 euro a month and you have a car, you know. 
and the lifestyle is just so easy. But you know, the language, uh, it's Montenegrin Serbian. I don't speak the language, but I speak English and most of the people spoke, you know, speaks English there. So um, it's so easy to navigate, even though you're a foreigner, like you could easily do things, bought a house, bought a car, set up a company and did so many things by not speaking the language. So I think it's so convenient. And this year, actually, the government just launched the digital nomad visa. And I'm so excited that when I get home, we'll be able to help more people to our NGO to, to bring more digital nomads to live in Montenegro and at the same time help the economy of the country. Wow. Okay. So I'm yeah. going. I'll be there. Yeah, you should go. You should go. I'll be back in summer. I'll host you there. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I mean, your place looks absolutely beautiful too. I mean, it looks yeah. like you've got a, a palace. So uh, I definitely would love to meet you in Montenegro. So let's let's make that a plan, or at least an intention. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a small house, but it's like a, it's nice. Uh, it's it, it's two different buildings, so I could still host a lot of people. I I have like three extra bedrooms for people could stay. But I'm getting divorced with my ex husband, so let's see. I hope to keep that or not. If we ended up selling it, I'll find another cute little place because I really wanted to own a co-living house that's my main goal in the next few years I really want to own like one nice villa and you know like just really focus on the digital nomad movement and digital nomad and the fire movement kind of thing you know you must have magic psychic powers because my very next question for you was going to be about your ex-husband uh, and the fact yeah. that you are splitting up. You've mentioned him a few times. Obviously, he became an integral part of your life and lifestyle. Yes. You, I can, I can attest personally to how messy and ugly it can be to break up on the road. But you also ran a business with him, so that's like additionally mm -hmm. messy and complicated. Do you have any advice for couples who are traveling on the road that either might help them stay together or if they need to split up, do you have any advice for couples that are traveling and working together to make that process a little bit easier? What I've realized is that since my I dated him and onwards, I never had money in my name. All of the money and the business is on my ex-husband's name because it's so convenient. He's British, you know, like storing money in a bound account or euro or anything and getting approved, opening like bank cards or, or everything. It's so convenient to have it in his name because he has the address, his parents has the address, and I didn't have anything in my name. And that's became the difficult part when we separated. Even though I was the one working and doing most of the stuff, everything is on his what i suggest like for new nomadic couples uh, most probably because uh, what happened was like when we started the life together we didn't know what we wanted to do so we really started the things together what i recommend is that you know when you go out there and be nomadic it's better that you have two separate accounts like whatever your spouse or partner is earning, that's his, whatever you are like making, it's yours. And just make sure you have like a joint later on that would finance all of the expenses that you will incur. And better not to do, uh, never to mix it, like, uh, like literally like, uh, you can be partners, business partners or what, but like have like a specific role that this is what I'm going to do and this is what you're going to do. And not to totally be, like mixed because you know like i was married and you know like you you thought like no because my parents that time was like why you don't have any savings in yours like why and blah blah and i was like well i'm married why why do i have to do anything if you know what i mean like we've done so much things together it's not gonna go anywhere but it, it could happen like everything could happen so yeah make sure that um you have your own skills that no matter what happens in this, like you can still finance yourself or like you could still earn money by being on your own and make sure that you have all of, like you have a savings that is outside of the marriage or the relationship. That is excellent advice, regardless of whether or not you're traveling, but especially if you are traveling and especially if you're running a business together, especially a remote business too, because so many lines get blurred, I think, when we work remotely. Uh, and especially when we're rem working remotely from abroad, lifestyle and work really become one. Uh, and then throw a romance, a relationship in there as well. And yeah, it, it's everything just turns into one cosmic soup. 
Now, I also read that uh, you've really had a rough couple of years because I also read that you recently had a major operation and mm -hmm. you were diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. I've had my own share of illnesses and major accidents abroad. And certainly I know it, it can be very challenging when you're traveling, especially if you're not surrounded by mm -hmm. the comforts, creature comforts that you're accustomed to. But also you learn who your friends are pretty quickly. That's true. <laughs> Do you have any advice or, or what have you learned from these experiences that you've had? And has this influenced or changed your life, lifestyle or career in any way? I was typically healthy, like before, like, uh, you know, like I was doing yoga, I was so fit until like 2014. But because I was getting into into these things, because I know that I I have issues in my childhood that I just don't want to talk about because that's past, you know. But like once you keep like putting it inside, putting it inside, you know, like not talk about it, it it triggers you and you're not aware like what's happening with the current situation. It was because of a trigger that happened in your past, you, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, I got involved in a car accident in Pakistan. It really like affected me like uh, physically, mentally and emotionally and everything. And then like, and I didn't know that all of this stress that I incurred from my childhood until the last few years and the things that's going on in my marriage and going on with my health, I ended up like last year having different bruises in my body. Like I just don't understand why is why am I always sick? And I just learned about it from my shrink that, you know, like and like some doctors, friends as well, that when there's too much stress, it's like eating your body. Like I had bruises. I oh my God, am I dying with cancer? Like, you know but uh like one big kick just happened was when they had like a gallbladder removal surgery last march it's not a major crazy major surgery it's still major because it's near your stomach but it's not like i'm going to die immediately <laughs> that kind of thing but that being on that in anesthesia it triggered you like oh my god i'm like exploding too much things going on and then i got hit with the news that you know like i'm getting divorced like my ex just left and you really, I really hit rock bottom in one go. Like, I was like, I lost my business. I lost my, my marriage. I lost my money. I lost everything. And, and then I had a mental breakdown and ended up posting things on social media. And then I got, I lost my, some friends and family who just wasn't want to deal with all of these dramas. But thankfully what I've learned like even though you post everything, you have friends uh, that you could talk to. They also are on their, like go on undergoing different problems that you never know like i was talking with some friends like talking about my, my, my dilemma but because i posted it and i didn't know that i have few friends that been through so much last year you know like losing much more things but they just don't post it but they're all concerned what i posted you know what i mean so i can't like tell them like this is what's going on and the best decision that i've ever done in my life i think so far is having a therapist that i could really talk to and like really guided me medically and telling you that no you're not really crazy this is what's going on in your brain and the therapist it's not just like you're talking to them but they really made you aware about the situation so for example there's something that would trigger you like something that you know, you know like it came back like ah oh, this is what's happening with me right now just becoming more aware and more mindful and um uh physically like i'm not as fit as what i was when i was you know way younger but after everything that happened to me in the last few years i think i'm in a much more happier and like much more peaceful state of my life like you know like just learn like you know whatever happens it is what it is and it's only going to get better but still i still have days that it's oh my god i feel sick today it was like what else is sick with you today you, you know like and then you know what to do Everything that you said is amazing, not only from the ability for people to be able to relate because we all have these kinds of experiences and we don't always know how to, to deal with them and to process them, but also I'm really impressed with how you've been able to learn from those experiences uh, in that, uh, you know, it cliche as it is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it, it really is true. When we have to go through these difficult experiences, we learn a lot from that. And that, that for me personally, anyway, informs the way that I move through this world in the future. And it informs the decisions that I make going forward. And you are beautiful and composed. And despite mm -hmm. having discovered, just discussed some really difficult things and experienced two years of just horrendousness. Uh, yeah. you, you're smiling. You really have uh, an amazing bubbly personality that has, okay. seems to endure. So your spirit is strong, I can tell. 
Oh, thank you. I should have because at the end of the day, I, I only have myself. I, I have like, you know, I have people who's going to be with me. But at the end of the day, it's just only I, I should just, you know, really love myself because I, this is the longest like person I'm going to be with, you know. Exactly. It's the longest relationship you're ever going to have is yeah, the one with yourself. Just, yeah. yeah. I definitely want to wrap things up. I want to respect your time. Is there, uh, where can people find you and connect with you? And do you have any final words of advice uh, for anyone who wants to follow in your footsteps? They could find me on my website. It's still Two Monkeys Travel Group. And my social media handles are still Two Monkeys Travel and catch that how K-A-C-H dot H-O-W-E. It's still Two Monkeys. I'm keeping it. I'm just finding another monkey to, to, <laughs> to continue the adventures. <laughs> Because some friends were like saying, so are you going to be one monkey travel now? I was like, no. Why? I don't want to be on my own. I'm going to always be with someone. I'm still young. So um, what I always tell people is that even though, like, just keep dreaming big. Seriously, no matter where you came from or, like, what you've gone through. Because even though, like, naysayers would tell you, like, you're ambitious, this is not going to happen and stuff like that. If you believe in your dreams, if you reach for the moon and you're, you know, like, if, if you try to, to what this is like a quote about, like, stars and moon, something like that, I just don't want to, I don't know. Shoot for the stars, hit the moon. moon. Yeah, yeah. Like, you just keep dreaming big because I still believe that dreams do come true. And all of my dreams happen. And then when I stopped dreaming because I thought I became more complacent that I achieve whatever it is, that's when things start crashing because you don't have motivation to keep going. And I think that's the only thing that is uh, really good in Israel. Like, you know, have hope that things will only get better no matter what happens. This chat has been a perfect balance mm -hmm. of practical practicality and practical tips, as well as inspiration and motivation. Thank yeah. you, Catch, so much for joining me today. You're welcome, Nora, and I can't wait to see you in Montenegro. I will hold yes. you there, and like maybe you'll encourage more digital nomads and other hobos like you to to, to move there because it's a freaking brilliant destination, and not a lot of people go there to live or just even visit, and not even a lot of people knows where it is. So I really hope that through your your platform, you could encourage more people to move there. Well, Montenegro has been on my list for a few years now, and that yeah. is due in large part to to Monkey's Travel Group uh, and yeah. uh, all the reading I've been able to do about it through your site. So thank you very much for informing the world and inspiring people to follow in your footsteps. If you were interested by anything that we have discussed here today, including some of our money tips uh, and some of the visa tips, you are going to absolutely love my checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long term. So while you're busy liking this video and subscribing to this podcast and series, click the link in the description or show notes so you can get your free checklist that dives even deeper into some of the things that Kat and I have discussed today. And you can hit the road with all your bases covered stress-free and effectively. My name is Nora Dunn. I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and I will catch you next time.